If you believe that's true, can I get another amen a little louder? Okay, come on, come on. Hey, um, one thing you need to know about Open Door Fellowship Church, we've been doing this a long time, almost 50 years, and one thing that we have always remained true in is that we believe that part of the design of the church that God set up is that there would be a group of leaders called elders um, that would shepherd and oversee the flock and take care of what's going on. And so um, many in this body have served in the office of elders. I'm seeing some right here, Mike Quinn, John Lynch. I'm seeing John DeForest. I'm seeing Tom Rickner. All have previously served. Um, but we have some new elders that we want to introduce to you as potential new elders. And so first I want to bring the elders up, the current elders up. And then, Matt, I'll let you take it away from here. And uh, I'm Debra Faddis, Matt Poppin, Jim Rosania. Dennis Martin can't be here this morning. He's feeling a little under the weather, so, or else he would be here. Matt and I can't stand too close together because we're matching 100%. We are matching. So it's really odd. Trying to, like, do this. He's here. got the wrong shoes on, though. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we would like to introduce and have come up Doug and Sue Sawyer. Yeah. Stuart Black. Paul and Kelly Lawrenson. and Matthew and Jessica Young. So I just want to take a, a moment really quick to let you know how these men came to be here, how, to, how they came to be considered as potential elders. Um, back in the beginning of the, this year, um, we kind of described the new process um, that we've gone through. We, we put together what was known as an elder identification team a really sweet group of 10 of us, uh, cross-section throughout the body of former pastors and elders and just really trusted voices, both men and women. And we asked you as the body, go talk to these people and tell them who you would see as being a good shepherd elder for our body. We came together, we had about 30 names, and these four names just kept rising to the top, rising to the top. And so the other identification team reached out to these men and said, hey, where is your heart at with serving in this role of el elder? Would you consider it? We got to invite them in and hear from them, hear where their heart was. And then the elder identification team said, we think these men would be great elders. Go meet with the elders, the current elders now, and see how, it, how, how that progresses. So that brings us to where we are today. Um, we've been meeting with them as elders for like the past three months or so. It's been really sweet. They all have an awesome desire to serve in this role. So uh, it's just been a really beautiful process, and we are blessed to have them considered as potential elders. So I'm going to have Devery kind of describe the next steps here. Thanks, Matt. So we don't really vote on them. That's not the process. But we do want to know your heart. And uh, one of the key factors for them to be to, to really come to what God wants them to do as an elder is for you to trust them. And part of that is take this time now between now and what are we saying the first of the year? Yeah. Uh, to, to meet with them. If you already know them, take them out to lunch and encourage them. If you don't, bring them over for dinner, take them out to lunch, meet them in the courtyard. Uh, they all could use a little extra help with some food, so uh, <laughs> just kidding. But, but get to know them and spend some time with them they would be excited for that. And um, uh, then in the meantime, if you are encouraged or, or concerned in any way, bring your concerns to one of the, the five of us, Caleb or Matt or uh, Jim, Dennis or myself, and, and let's talk about it. But, but this is the time that we get to, to approve without a vote, but to really step in and say, we love these people and we want them to be part of our leadership. And then January 1st, the, the goal is, unless something changes drastically, we would actually uh, install them as elders. And uh, they're, they're already serving us in that way. So, It sure has been a pleasure and a, a huge blessing to have been 
meeting with these guys weekly for the last three months, and uh, and I'll stand for each one of them that they are four uh, extremely go godly men, and uh, they are willing and desiring to serve you all. So, um, if if we could stand, and I know we can't hold hands, so don't don't hold hands unless it's your spouse. But if you feel comfortable just raising a hand. I would love this to be a covering over these guys. So if we can just create that, that'd be great. Father in heaven, um, thank you for these four men. And thank you for your call on their life to serve this church. And uh, Father God, this is your church. And uh, we say it's led by men, but it's not. It's led by you. And Father, give us the desire and the ability to allow the Holy Spirit to work within each one of us up here. And God, I just ask that you work through now these four new elders and uh, allow your spirit to work in them so they can help us lead this body of believers. We ask this in your name. Amen. Not to worry, Doug Sawyer is not about to rob a stagecoach. He just <laughs> looks that way. He just looks that way. I've been joking with them all that at some point during the elder process, they have to go on like a wilderness challenge where we drop them off in the middle of nowhere. It still has yet to happen, but we pray that the Lord provides for that. Hey, uh, my name's Caleb Lynch. If you're just, just joining us, uh, if you're joining online, my name's Caleb Lynch, lead pastor here at Open Door Fellowship Church. It is an absolute um, unbelievable privilege that I get to do this. I see it as one, and um, man, I, I love being here with you guys. So this is a, this is a joy in my heart. We've got, we've got some stuff to cover today, and I am excited for it. Um, if, if you're just tuning in for this series, we, we started last week, we started a new series through the book of 1 John, calling it Walking in the Light. Uh, we do believe that um, Jesus Christ, we believe that he is Lord, we believe that um, the Word of God, which is called the Bible, we believe describes this man um, showing up on earth. Um, we believe that he always was, that he was from the beginning, and he always will be, but that he actually took on human form and showed up on earth, and he came to defeat darkness. Um, that's what we believe he came to do, is to defeat darkness. And we believe that one day, uh, thousands of years ago, he did. Um, he went and took uh, darkness and looked it straight in the face and said, uh, you have no power over me, and he defeated it. And then one morning, he came out of a tomb and um, shined the light for anyone who would choose to put their trust in him as Lord and Savior. And so we believe that, and we believe that under that umbrella of truth that we are now citizens of the light. And so that's the premise for this book. Um, that is the premise that Paul, or sorry, that John, the author, lays out for us. And um, let me pray for it. Lord, uh, we keep coming to you in prayer this morning, and that is a good thing. And uh, Lord, we do... Uh, we do ask that you use this book, that these writings of John, that you would use it to shape our minds, to shape us into who you've created us to be, and that ultimately that it would draw our hearts near to you. We know you're as near to us as you can be, um, but Lord, we long to have our hearts unified with you in a beautiful way. And so, Lord, we know the world needs your light, and we know that um, your word claims that we have it those of us that have put our trust in you. So teach us what that means and what that looks like. We give you this morning, we give you this book, in Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bible, we will be in 1 John 1, 5 through 10 today. Um, I'd, love to, I'd love to just read it. Uh, I've got two slides for it. I'd love to just, I'll just read it, and then um, we'll kind of go from there. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. And we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, 
His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and He is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. I wrote it in my own way. Can I read it to you? I want to tell you what we learn from the man himself, Jesus. Here's what he told us. He said, he is light, like all the good, no bad. But then he said, here's the deal. If you claim that you are tight with him and that you are in good standing with him, but you do not behave correctly, then you're actually not tight with him and you're, not, and you're making up lies about your relationship with him. Only those who keep doing all the right things, more good, less bad, can make him happy and remain close to him. Those are the people who stay in the light. And then here's what's cool. If you keep living well, like make it into a habit, then his amazing sacrifice on the cross will actually save you. But if you keep living super bad, even his cleansing is not powerful enough to make you right. That's only for the good people. Okay, but here's what's cool. Don't worry if you keep sinning. Just keep asking him to forgive each sin. Don't forget about any sins, otherwise they won't get forgiven. It's up to you to get those records of sin in good standing. So that's it. It's that easy. Keep living wholesome and keep asking for forgiveness every time you do something wrong and you will stay in the light. If that translation sounds like something you're used to, I'm sorry. I do not believe those are the words that John is trying to describe to us. Let, let, me, let me try again. <laughs> Everyone's like, where are those elders? Get those elders back in here. Should we try it again? I want to tell you what we've learned from the man himself, Jesus. Here's what he told us. He said, he's light, like all the good, no bad. But then he said, here's the deal. If you claim that you're a Christian, but you don't act like, like Christ, then you might want to ask yourself if you're really, truly a Christian at all. Only bad people claim one thing and do something else. Here's the benefit that true Christians get, the ones that act like Christians. They get the gift of cleansing, purity, white as snow. What a great gift his cleansing is. But it doesn't come without a bit of continual work. If you slip up, like say a word like darn, or accidentally kind of maybe cut someone off in traffic, then you just tell Jesus what a terrible person you are, and you beg him for forgiveness. And if you really mean it, if he knows your heart, then he'll forgive you. It's this. It's this easy for the, for the Christian. You just keep being aware of your shortcomings because that's what makes you more humble and righteous. Because the truth is, God likes it when you live in a defeated state because that's when he can really help you. Unfortunately, um, unfortunately, um, the, the passages we just read from the actual word of God have been used many times over, thousands of times over, millions of times over to, to teach what I just read. And I believe these passages in some ways have done more harm to the church than good. I do not believe that these passages are to motivate well-meaning Christians to live a more wholesome life. I believe these are foundational theological statements about the truth of those who have found ourselves in Christ. So let's unpack them. Sorry, I did that to us, that read it that way. I'm sorry, I apologize. Okay, um, let's put up the first one. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Um, we could get an amen for that one. That is some beauty right there. Um, here's how light gets defined in, in the word of God. Light is health, 
It's good, it's life, it's clarity, it's truth, it's hope, it's joy, it's freedom, it's revelation. It is hope. It's good news, it's salvation, it's glory, it's holiness, it's purity, it's forgiveness, it's love. That's what light gets defined as in Scripture and probably a few more that I couldn't find. If you remember the very beginning of the book, talks about the creation, right? We believe Jesus was there at creation. We believe he is God. We believe he was all in on all that. And on verse 3, it says, let there be light. And we believe that he is light. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there in that moment? Like, does he just yell out his own name? Like, let there be Jesus. <laughs> I don't know what he did. But what a beautiful picture of his existence, his being, the fullness of what he is in that very moment showing up in the existence of our normal lives, what we see it is. Would that moment have been unbelievable that the, that the full beauty revelation of the light of God now became visible for all to see? Pretty cool. Let's go verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. And we don't practice the truth. Um, the way this verse gets translated a lot is that if you claim you're a Christian, but you don't actually live the Christian way, then you're actually living in darkness. Do you know that that's how this verse gets used most often? That's not what it's saying. And, and let me explain this to you. Um, you are either light or you are dark if you are in Christ Jesus, right? Or, or not in Christ Jesus. It's not some switch that you can turn on and off. Do you understand that? This is not some switch that you can go, okay, I'm, I'm a Christian, but now I'm being a bad boy, so now I'm in the dark. No, you are either in light or you are in darkness, period. There is there is no in-between. There is no melding of the two. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You know, the only part of that song I don't like is the part that says, don't let Satan blow it out. He can't blow it out. If you have been found in Christ, you are now a child of the light. You are now light. You are no longer darkness. You are light. And there is nothing that anything in all of creation can do to turn that light out. You are light. Let's keep rolling before I get too, too preachy. <laughs> Verse 7. But if we walk in light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Like, this is a big verse. There's a lot in it. You could read it, but if you behave correctly, as he does, then you can have fellowship with him, and then his blood will cleanse you. We understand that that's probably not what it's saying. Do we really think that our fellowship with Christ is dependent on our behavior? I, I pray we do not. I pray that we read enough scripture to realize that our fellowship with Christ Jesus is by the work that, that he did and our trusting in it. Do you really believe, do you really think that the blood of Jesus only works if we keep walking in a good way? That would be how you could translate it. If you keep walking in the light, then the blood of Jesus and his son cleanses us from all sin. We know that's not the truth, right? We know that it is not our behavior that makes us right and cleanses us. It is Jesus himself that makes us right and cleanses him. So he, he's talking about something different here. He's talking about a positional place. He's talking about the fact that you are in light, right? Right? It'd be like it'd just be like describing uh, the way that you are walking. You're not talking about the actual walking. You're talking about the position in which you're walking, right? You're walking 
in the light. You're continuing to move forward in the light. Does that make sense? We're not talking about the way in which you walk. We're talking about the position in which you walk. The statement that helps us the most here is where it says, circle this in your Bible, as he is in the light. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, circle that, how, how was he in the light? What did he do? He was the light. It's who he was. What, what, was it his behavior that made him in the light? No, it was who he was. He was the light. Remember the opening lines? God is light. Remember what Jesus said when he was with his disciples? He says, I am the light of the world. It's an astounding statement when we realize what he is telling us to do. He's saying, be who you are, right? Look, as he is in the light, how is he in the light? It's who he was. The same way is how we are to walk, who we are. We are in the light. We are children of light. Hey, let, me, let me give us some verses because this will help us. This is Ephesians 5, 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. If there's no other verse that helps us understand this, this one is huge. Because look at, what the, look at the words. He's not saying at one time you were acting in darkness. One time you were behaving in dark ways. No, he's not saying that. And then now you're acting like, like a good boy should. No, he's saying one time you were actually dark. Like, you literally were darkness, and now you are literally light. Is that astounding to you, that the work of the cross is that powerful? That he moved you from a dominion, a place of darkness, into a place of light? Let's do another verse. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who has called you out of darkness and into light. Let's, let's do another one. John 8, 12. Again, Jesus spoke to this, them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever believes in me will not walk in darkness. Like literally, it's impossible for them to walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. Should we do more? Let's do one more. John 12, 36. While you have the light, believe in it so that you may become sons of light. How do you, how do you get the light? Believe in it. Let's keep rolling. Verse 8. If you say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. This is a, this is a pretty astounding statement when you think about it. If the claim that you put out is a claim that I have not sinned, you actually have no Christ within you. Isn't that an interesting statement? He's saying, if, if you're actually going to believe wholeheartedly that you are without any sin, that you've, you've behaved well enough to get yourself to heaven, it's, it's pretty good proof that he's not in you. Because in order for him to be in you, What's the next verse say? Let's go there. You have to confess your sins. You have to say, I have sin, right? I, 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 I on by myself, am not good enough to get myself in right standing with God or to my eternal resting place, which is called heaven. He's saying, so if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And then that's where the cleansing comes from. Will you go back? He, uh, um, he's going he's gonna to use three different phrases here. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, right? He's already used the, the term light. He's going to use truth, and then he's going to use the word. Remember, he, um, Jesus claims that he is the truth and that he is the, he is the word. And so when you see these phrases like that, and the truth is not in us, he's referencing Jesus. He is not in you. That's an important thing. Go to verse 9 again, if we confess our sins. Yeah. Let's be clear about something. 
because Jesus died on the cross for the sins of men and women, all are not automatically forgiven. Does that make sense? What's, what's happening here? Just because Jesus gets on a cross and dies for all humanity, that's who he died for. He died for every single person. Not all immediately get forgiven because of his work. Right? We know that. How that happens is through believing. Believing that he is the one who can take your sin and actually deal with it. That's significant. That's what this verse is outlining, because I'll tell you this, you you will get in circles of believers, those who have put their trust in Jesus, that that do say that everyone gets in because of the cross. It says that he died for all, for God so loved the world that he died for all, right? But the truth is, just because he died for all does not mean that all receive the benefit and the blessing of his gift. The way you receive it is by trusting and believing in him as Lord, as Savior, as Almighty One, period. That's the way you get forgiven. Does that make sense? Really significant theological concept. What if we forget to confess a sin? Right? It says if if we confess our sins... And he's going to be faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Well, well, what if I'm walking along and I do something really stupid and then the day goes on and I eat a bunch of candy on Halloween and I get that little coma thing and then I forget and then I forget to go to him and confess him of my sin. Is that, is that one not forgiven? So, so what, is this verse, what is this verse then saying? This, is, this is, must not be a continual daily thing that I must do to get right with God on the daily. If my being forgiven is on the basis of how often I remember to confess my sins, there's a high likelihood my forgiveness is going to fall a little bit short. Even the things that I do that are self-serving, do you know those, those are sins? And oftentimes they're the very things that I like go like, that was pretty good. <laughs> and I'm not confessing like any of those. So am I not, not getting home? Is my salvation on the line if I forget to confess my sins on the daily? Be careful with this verse careful with this verse. Remember who he's writing to in this very moment. Remember the line right before it? If we claim we have no sin, right? We deceive. What does the verse right after it say? Put that one up. If we say we have no sin, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Remember who he's talking to in this very specific moment. He's talking to those who say, I, I think I probably get in just kind of on my own like, like deal. Like, I think I'm kind of good. Like, I, yeah, I know that, like, I've done some things, but, like, overall, I'm, I, why would God keep me out? Right? And he's saying, no, 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 listen, listen. At some point, if you're going to be in right standing with the God of the universe, at some point in time, you're going to have to confess your sins. You're going to have to admit that you couldn't make it on your own. And in that very moment, he will forgive you of all your sins, past, present, and future, and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And you will now have the righteousness of Christ within you, period, now, forever. This is not a daily act of cleansing yourself. Andrew Farley, one of my favorite authors, says this is not a a spiritual Christian daily bar of soap that you rub on your body. This is a one-time act that took place for any of us that have put our trust in Jesus, and it is final. Do you know that he's seated? Do, Do you know that the work has been completed? Like, do you know that the work, do you know, do you know why the high priest never sat down? And in all of the Jewish tradition, the high priest never sat down because the work was never finished. There was never atoning sacrifice that was complete, that would work, that would do enough for all time's sake. 
So they were always stood standing. But Jesus got on the cross and he took on and bore the sin that we confessed that we hadn't confessed. And he said, it is finished. You see, here's the beauty of the gospel um, is that the good news of the gospel is that it's not up to you to memorize your sin. It's his memory and his removal of your sin that makes you clean. Is that unbelievable? So it's not only your good behavior that doesn't get you home, but it's, not, it's also not your ability to remember your bad behavior that helps you get home. It's all just kind of him. It's beautiful. Anything apart from that message is not the gospel of Christ. Let's, let's, let's go to 10. If we say we have uh, not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. There's that word. He is the word. It's not in us. Many reject the system in place because it means they must lay down, it feels like they must lay down their self-worth or their pride or their accomplishments. And they go, no, 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 no. I, I, don't, I, I think I'm good on my own. And so they reject the very system that God has put in place about how you are made right, about how you are made good, about how you are made whole, about how you are redeemed, about how you are made righteous and holy and pure. They reject it. So because of that, the word is not in them. And, and essentially, in doing so, we actually make him a liar. He's not a liar. He can't be a liar. But in doing so, we say the words, the truth that have been outlined in the word are not true, and therefore he's a liar. Those are some strong words. Why do so many people reject the truth? Right? Like, like there's this beautiful outline, this beautiful gift of salvation and hope and freedom and life that's on offer, like he calls it fullness of life on offer. And yet so many go, no, 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 I don't want anything to do with it. It's silly talk. Do you know why that is? It's because they're dark. They're in darkness. And you know what it says about darkness? It says that it makes you blind. Let's read a verse. It's, the verse says it better than I do. This is 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world, who's the God of this world? Satan. Has blinded their minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as, our, as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what darkness does, doesn't it? It blinds you. I can remember... Um, Correct me if the story's not right, but I can remember being on a, a childhood vacation, and we were visiting like Cape Cod area, Massachusetts, and we were going to a town maybe called Falmouth, okay? And so we arrived late at night, and it was dark, and we are driving into the town, and my sister Amy is terrified. She's like, I want to go home. I'm scared. When you looked out the window, all the leaves were shaking, and it looked really sinister, like, the town looked really sketchy and weird. We got in super late, so there was no one out. It was like a ghost town. And me, being the older brother, I was making her uh, more afraid, because that's what we do. But um, was that a wolf I just saw there? No, but we would, so we were driving along, driving along, and she literally was like, I want to go home, I want to go home, I want to go home, I want to go home. I'm scared to death of what I'm seeing. We get into the hotel room, we go to bed, we wake up in the morning, and it is one of the most beautiful little harbor towns in all of the world amazing what darkness does. It makes you blind. It doesn't allow you to see the reality of the truth that is in front of you. And the truth is the Word of God. And what's happening is that there are many 
who the God of this world, Satan, has put a blindfold over their eyes and has kept them in darkness so much so that the truth, the very truth of the word of God is been on a veil to them. They can't see it. Do you know, do, do you know what exposes the darkness, like literally brings it out of the darkness? Light. Do you know who is light? You are. Did, did we not just read these verses? You are the light of the world along with the man himself. What is John doing? He is doing a beautiful bit of work of not asking you to change your behavior, but inviting you into something that is already true for you for the benefit of humanity that is dwelling in darkness. That's what this book is going to be about. And if we can start with this understanding, it is going to shed light, literally, on the rest of how he outlines this book. So much of what he's trying to do throughout this book is to tell you, this is true about you, here's the evidence that it's true about you, and here's what it gets to mean for humanity. That's what he's trying to do throughout this book. He is not saying, if you want to be this, act this way, and then good will come. That is not what he is doing through this book. I can promise you that. And yet that's what gets taught a lot of times. He is telling you, here is who you are. And here is the result of the fact that that's who you are. And here is the good that it will do in, in this world. Do you see the difference there? So let's rewrite it. When we were with Jesus... He told us, he said he was the light. And we actually saw it. We believed it. We were convinced of it. I know some of you think that you can just claim that you belong to Christ even if you don't. Like, like maybe you attend church or you give to charity or you agree with the morality or the ethics of the Bible. But you've not chosen to believe in Jesus himself. Uh, it breaks my heart to tell you, but you're still in darkness. But for those who have actually believed in him, they have become light, just like he is light. We have been adopted into his family of light. There is no other way for us to live than to be in light. And it's amazing, he himself was the one that removed all the darkness from you through his cleansing payment. If you, went, if you want in on this, at some point you're going to have to admit you need a Savior. That your way of living is not good enough to get you to heaven on your own. You'll have to admit that you've messed up big time. And here's what's amazing. In that very moment, he will forgive you of every dark you have ever done and ever will do. In fact, he already paid for it 2,000 years ago, and he's been sitting, waiting for you. It's time to wake up. The magic ingredients is, is actually fairly simple. Will you believe in him? Don't make the claims about what he did false by trying to do it on your own. Accept the amazing gift that his word and life and light are yours to be had in his name. I like that version better. Here's my prayer. That if you don't know the reality, the truth of this, if these are new verses for you, if you believe that um, for maybe the first time you're starting to accept this reality, um, here's my prayer. Is that um, these words, that this book would start to be an awakening in your heart. Um, similar to that, I get this picture of, of when I go and like, do you remember being a little kid in your room and mom and dad would wake you up for school? And at first, it's just like this noise that wakes you up. And then you realize it's a voice that's waking you up. And then you realize that that voice is calling your name. And then you wake up into the light. That would be my prayer, is that for any of you that have not put your trust in Jesus, that you would begin to hear his voice calling your name and inviting you into the position of light, awakening you into a new 
way of life, which is called walking in the light, positional light. That would be my prayer for those of us that maybe have not heard this good news. What about those of us that have heard this good news? All right, preacher, give me something to do. If you want to do something, let's start with just being. Be who you are, and the do will be a result of who you be. Don't do so that you can be, be so that you can do. It's the difference between revealing versus producing. It's the difference between Superman and like Iron Man, right? Like he created to be a superhero, Superman was a superhero, and then he... It's, okay. <laughs> For what purpose? What's, what's the purpose? What, what, why is there value in this way of living, living where you literally let the very thing that you are shine? What's, what's the purpose? What's the value in this? Well, let's, let's, um, let's let the Word of God tell us. This is John 3, 20 through 21. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This this is an astounding theme. When we allow the truth of who we are to come out to play, what we are essentially doing is we're saying, look at the amazing work that God has done through me. This was not of my own. This was only due to the fact that the light of the world shines through me and has made me a child of the light. That's what we're getting to do when we do that. Isn't that a, isn't that a beautiful thing? Let's go one more. Matthew five sixteen. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. This is so cool too. Same thing, same thought, right? Let your light shine. Allow the truth of who you are, the the new creation life flow out of you. Don't hinder it, right? Let it come out to play. And here's what's crazy. When people see it, when they see the results of this light coming out of you, what are they going to do? They're going to give glory to the Father. And that's so cool. You think that those good works would (laughs) produce people going, Man, look at that guy. But here's what it does. True light, when true light gets out, people go, oh my gosh, there is a God in heaven. It's pretty cool. He's not appealing to your behavior. He's appealing to your partnership. If we can grasp these fundamental truths, these fundamental theological concepts, we will understand all of the book of 1 John. And it is a beautiful book, my friends. Let me pray. Lord, we believe that the crux of all of this was a, was a dark, dark day. That you hung from a cross in the dark. And that it seemed like darkness had won. And yet it hadn't. You, um, you rose victorious, Lord. You are victorious. Darkness has no claim. And we believe that. We declare that. We also receive it, Lord. We so want to receive the reality of who you call us. And we know that you call us light. Lord, we are honored. We are humbled by this reality that we get to partner with you in bringing light to the world. We love you so much, Lord. Jesus, I I don't know where I'd be without you. I know I'd be dark. We thank you for your cross. We thank you for your resurrection. We take this bread and we take this cup, Lord, in remembrance of you defeating darkness. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.